Welcome to chapter 5. In this chapter, we will discuss alternative approaches to the issue and commit stages. So, issue and commit stages the way we have described in chapter 4. Uh, this has kind of been described in a very simplistic manner. So, a modern out of order processor is way more complicated uh, than the basic description that has been provided in chapter 4. Nevertheless, uh, the aim here uh, is to basically look at some of the corner cases and then move on to a simpler design which of course is less efficient and then discuss. Uh, so, I have the uh, I have the schedule over here and so then we discuss first we complicate our design then we simplify it and discuss something which is less efficient. And finally, we discuss compiler based techniques, where of course, we discuss a different paradigm, where we discuss uh, how to use software based techniques that include smart compilers and profilers to generate efficient code. So, in this chapter, we do require some background and the background is of course, chapter 4 on the issue, execute and commit stages. So, we will start with out of order pipelines. This is something that is required. Uh, so, the for the background, then of course, we need to know the wake up select mechanism in great detail and finally, precise exceptions and instruction commit. So, the requirements for this chapter are these three things which you will get in chapter 4. So, in chapter 5, the main thing that we look at is called aggressive speculation where uh, we complicate things. As you see this nice looking painting over here, uh, even with three or four simple crayons, a complicated picture has been drawn. Something very similar will be done in hardware, where uh, with our basic mechanisms. So, what are the basic mechanisms? Well, if you think about it in hardware, we always joke that hardware essentially has a set of registers and a set of wires, that is it. So, whatever we do is just with registers and wires and with nothing else. So, with that we implemented a host of stuff. So, the biggest attraction in that sense in the previous chapter which was chapter 4 was branch prediction which is one form of speculation where if we detect that a branch has been mispredicted, we flush the pipeline, right. So, we flush the pipeline. And when do we do that? We wait for the mispredicted branch to reach the head of the reorder buffer. At that point, we detect it and we flush the pipeline. This is not the only form of speculation. We have other kinds of speculation as well, which we will discuss in uh, this chapter. So, these other kinds of speculation are load latency speculation and value speculation which we will discuss uh, in this lecture. Now, the idea here is simple. With load latency speculation, it is that we have different levels of memory. We have an L1 cache, L2 cache, uh, main memory and so on. So, uh, the, we have a memory hierarchy basically. So, the pipeline is connected to the uppermost level of memory, which is fast, so which we have assumed to take one or two cycles. But that does not contain all the memory locations. So, then we have an L2 cache which contains a superset. So, we can make a guess that we will find the value in the L1 cache. But if we do not find the value, we will have to go to the L2 which takes more time. But from the point of view of the pipeline, when we do an early broadcast, we can as we shall see in some cases, in many cases rather, we can make a guess that we will find the load in the L1 cache and proceed. But what if our guess is wrong? Well, we will see what needs to be done. Similarly, we can also predict values. So, recall that for read after write dependencies, which were true dependencies, we have not done anything. We said that look, it is a read after write dependency. We have a producer, we have a consumer. The producer produces the value, the consumer consumes the value. We have nothing to do, right? That was our stand. But if we have a producing instruction over here, let us IP, which produces something that the consumer instruction consumes. 
so uh, if this is let's say a memory location or a register we can have a value predictor if it is possible to predict the value in this case we can run the producer and consumer in parallel and the dependency is broken of course if the value prediction is wrong so in this case is speculation because we not only predict but we also move forward so that is speculation so if the speculation is wrong then of course there is trouble right we need to do something so uh what do we need to do well we will see but the problem at hand is that in an aggressive processor we do a lot of guesswork based on that we wake up our instructions and we execute them sometimes the guesswork turns out to be wrong and in that case we need to do something that's the crux of our discussion what are the types of aggressive speculation well there are many many types but these are clearly the most common one is address speculation where we try to predict the address of a load and uh, we uh, dispatch the load early to the memory system such that all the instructions that are dependent on the load can be woken up this is slightly more specific where we predict the dependencies between loads and stores that allows us to do many things we can send loads early we can forward data between stores and loads bypassing unresolved stores next is latency speculation where we assume that a given access will hit in the yeah, either in the load store queue or in the data cache a hit means that we will get the value right so a memory access will take one cycle or two cycles in the sense we know the latency then we have a value prediction which of course is the hardest but it is the only way of working around read after write dependencies so uh, there is no way of actually solving read after write dependencies this problem the only way that we can actually still get a high ipc in code that has such dependencies if we somehow make the producer and the consumer instructions run in parallel this is possible if let's say the value that the consumer instruction reads that value is predicted and on the basis of that we proceed so this is known as a speculative execution and uh, modern processors do embody many many kinds of speculation like this but mind you with any kind of speculation there is a chance of a mistake in that case something needs to be done so let's look at our address speculation so we have seen this before so this uh, diagram over here we had seen something very similar while we were predicting the outcome of branches so uh, the predictor is generic so we had discussed uh, this there also that this is a generic structure of a predictor so let's say for a given memory address if we want to predict the address of uh, the load or a store we can use exactly the same structure where we use the n least significant bits we use it to access a table of two raised to the power n entries wherever there is a hit uh you know if let's say there is a match over here then there will be an address over here and this we will use as the load address can be the store address as well but since loads are on the critical path we typically do the prediction for loads so this is a very simple scheme where we predict the last address right and unlike branch predictors we cannot use saturated counters over here because this problem is not amenable to saturated counters right so it's not a, it's not fundamentally a counting problem we are storing an address so in this case we store the last address so as we had discussed the branch predictor gives the generic structure of a predictor which of course can be used in many many different cases scenarios so let us now look at a different kind of predictor called a stride based address predictor so in this case let's take a look at the c code first the c code is doing something that is rather simple uh the c code is just taking an array of 10 elements and adding all the 10 elements and producing a sum so what we have over here we is that we have sum plus equal to array i where i is varying from 0 to 9 so we are adding the first 10 elements 
So that's what we are getting, the sum of the first See, if I were to do it in assembly, I can convert it to simple disk assembly where I map I to 0, sum to R2. Uh, sorry, I map I, uh, I map I to R1, sum to R2, and the base address of the array R is stored in R0. So what I do is that I compare R1 with 10 every cycle. If the comparison fails, if there is no equality, if there is inequality, then I load the value of the base of the array to R3 and then I update the sum over here and then uh, what I do is I increment the memory address which is the base address of the array over here. I increment the loop index and then I jump back over here. So this line is what I want to draw your attention to first. In this case we in increment the base address by 4. Why, why 4? Because we are assuming that the size of an integer is 4 bytes. So that's why we are incrementing it by 4. Now let us consider this load instruction which is the most important. So it's so important that I'm erasing the ink on the slide. Whenever I do that, uh, it should be very important. So here what I'm doing is that I am loading a value from the address stored in register R0. This line should be read along with this line where we are incrementing the value of R0 by 4. So the address stored over here is getting incremented by 4 every iteration. So we can think of this as a stride based pattern where if I have an address predictor over here, then the address predictor will have to explicitly take into account the fact that every time we access this instruction, uh, the address is getting incremented by 4, right? And 4 in this case is the stride. So what do we do? Well, we do use a different stride based predictor because in this case, uh, the last address based predictor will not be useful. So we need to use a different kind of predictor called a stride based predictor. So the last address, let it be A, right? Uh, let the stride be S and the pattern be P. So what we have is that we have a similar table as over here, which of course is addressed with the n LSP bits of the program counter. Each entry looks like this, where we have the address, the stride and the pattern. So in each entry, uh, the what we store is the memory address computed the last time. Along, sorry, al along with that, I think I should, something has gone wrong. Okay. Yeah. Along with that, along with the memory address computed the last time, the this instruction with this PC was executed, we store two additional pieces of information. So we store what is the stride, which means historically what the memory address has been getting incremented with and whether we follow a stride based pattern or not. So let's say for the sake of prediction, right, if let's say the pattern bit is 1, which means that we can conclude that we follow a stride based addressing pattern, we can predict A plus S as the next address. When we actually compute the address of this load instruction, so let's say the computed address is A dash, so we subtract A dash minus A. and we equate that with the stride. So I should use a double equal to because it is clear it's an, it's an equality and not an assignment. So we pretty much equate that a dash minus a and see if it's equal to the stride. So if a stride based addressing pattern is indeed being followed, this will be equal to the stride. So we update the last address from a, we update it to a dash. The stride of course remains the same and the pattern bit is set to 1 if it is not already 1. All right. But let us say that a stride based addressing is not being followed, then we have a choice. So if this is a 1 bit from 1, we can convert it to 0. 
or this can also be a saturating counter. So it is important to understand that a saturating counter is a generic mechanism which is not just limited to branches, right? Clearly not. So for example, if I were to consider the code that is shown here in slide number 7, again I want to draw your attention so I am erasing the ink on the slide. So let us say that this was part of some high level function foo. We will find a stride based addressing pattern over here, right? So this is something that we will find. But after we exit the function and we come back again, right? So let's say we exit and a long time later again we come back, we will find that for the first axis the stride based pattern will not hold. But that does not mean that the behavior has changed. This is essentially a temporary aberration. If we use a saturating counter, then what we can do is we can ignore that and we can still continue to predict on the basis that it is indeed stride based and the rest of the predictions will turn out to be correct. So that is why whenever we store something about the past history, we should think not once but twice but thrice that what exactly is the pattern that is being followed and how much of hysteresis do you want to give it. If we want to tolerate these occasional anomalies, this should be a saturating counter. That's number one. And let's see if the stride changes, then we should see whether we should, uh, you know, just treat it as an occasional anomaly and not change the stride. Or let's say if there's a persistent change in the stride, then of course the value of the stride S should be changed over here. All right. So much of this depends on actual simulation and actual engineering. But uh, the key idea is that we store these three pieces of information. And the prediction if a stride based pattern is followed is always A plus S. And whenever we resolve the address, we always compute A dash minus A, where A dash is the resolved address and compare it with the stride. If it is equal, well, that's great. We can increase the confidence of P. If it is not equal, we can do several things. Much of that depends upon whether P is a saturating counter or not and the amount of hysteresis that we want to give it, right? And so there is no hard and fast rule on how much of hysteresis needs to be given. So typically what happens is that we run hundreds, thousands of simulations on the programs that people are expected to use and we look at the behavior that these programs are following. All right, so we have discussed address speculation now. Let us now discuss the load store dependence speculation. So what has been seen is that if a given memory address, let's say it has a load, if there is a collision, collision means a same memory address with a previous store in the pipeline, this tends to be, in, in a sense, a predictable steady state behavior. And these collisions, in a certain sense, can be predicted. Which means that if I have a load, I can predict with a reasonably high accuracy that, look, the value will actually come from a previous store that is there in the pipeline. In the sense, an LSQ forwarding will give the value and the value will not really come from the data cache. Why is this the case? Well, we will have to look at the nature of the code. So a lot of code is essentially this register spill code, right? Uh, which leads to this behavior that when we spill a register because we run out of registers and then we execute a function and restore it. In that case, what happens is that, uh, well, we have a store and then we have a load. And as I said, we can either spill because we run out or we spill it because uh, of a function call. Regardless of the reason, we always have the store load pairs. And since they are not that far apart, they will still be in the pipeline. So moment we see this load, we can say with high confidence that look, there is a previous store that will supply value to it. And there are many other examples of coding patterns. Uh, mainly with respect to function calls or with respect to, you know, loading data and so on, where such a pattern holds. So if you can predict these collisions with good enough accuracy, 
So let's say if you predict that there are no collisions, then we don't have to wait for unresolved stores. We just send the load directly to the cache, we get the value and we wake up the consumers. Or let's say if you predict that there is a very high probability of a collision between a store and a later load, even if there are unresolved stores in the middle, we need not wait for them. Because if you have predicted that, look, this store and this load are going to collide and nobody else, then we directly forward the value, don't wait for these, and the load proceeds. So this, of course, is highly dependent upon the way that we write programs. But given that most assembly programs are written roughly in a similar manner, and this pattern holds across languages, across compilers, across processors, that is why processor design should be designed in such a way to leverage this pattern. So there is an important philosophical insight over here. Almost all architectural optimizations are in a sense based on, they are learning based optimizations, right? So they look at the way that programmers actually write their code and on the basis of that they decide what kind of hardware will best take advantage of these patterns. If there were no patterns, no architectural optimization would actually work. Okay, so how do we find collisions? Nothing. Uh, we have a standard template that we have set up in our good old branch prediction days. So given that we have learned that, we just keep on using it. So some loads do show a consistent behavior. They can be predicted as colliding or non-colliding. It's a little bit of idea. Whenever you have these bulbs, that is when we have our insight. So we have a collision history table CHT which takes an n-bit PC, n-bit program counter and then well it points to an entry same as a branch predictor. We predict whether it's colliding or non-colliding and here you can have a single bit or you can have a saturating counter. No problem at all. Right? So we can have a saturating counter which can take care of those occasional anomalies. How many bits to have? Well, a lot of those are outcomes, outcrops of a simulation related study. Let us now discuss how to use the CHT. So the CHT is used like this that we can use it at two points. We can uh, do the prediction itself at two points. The first is at the time of decoding, which of course I'm not showing over here. It's not, uh, can be done. Uh, also, it can be done at the time that we resolve the address of the load. So, it can be done at two points. So, I'm showing uh, here that when we compute the address of a load, we access the CHT. So, this is of course at the time of resolution. But also it can be done at the time of decoding. So in this case it doesn't matter. But we will show other cases where it actually does. So if the, the load is predicted to be colliding, what it basically means is that in the load store queue there is a store which has the same address with the load. So it doesn't mean that there are no intervening stores in the middle that don't have the same address, but there is at least one. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to wait for all the prior stores in the load store queue to be resolved, to get resolved. Once they get resolved, what needs to be done is two things. Either we get this forwarded value, that is option one, well then there is no problem at all, or we send the value to the data cache. If it is predicted to be non-colliding, which means that there is no forwarding that is going to happen, most likely of course, then we send the load directly to the data cache and we are done. All right. Once the address is resolved, uh, so basically the address of let's say the store in consideration is resolved. So if you don't know which one, then pretty much once the addresses of all the stores before the load are resolved, right, and uh, let's say all of them, it's known the entire state of the load store queue before the load is known, 
right the store queue actually not the ls queue but the store queue before the load is known we are in a position to see whether there is a collision or not right so if any of these addresses match then there is a collision else not so in this case we update the chd with this information and let's say that there was a collision but we speculated past it there is a need to recover the state as simple as that so this essentially allows us to send some loads which are non colliding to the data to the data cache l1 cache without waiting for unresolved stores before it to get resolved so so that wait time we avoid so which means we can send loads early we can wake up their consumers so this gives us more ipc right uh, it gives us more parallelism and more ipc this can be augmented with more information which is where when we predict becomes important so this uh, so let's say that we do this prediction at decode time so what we can augment it, it augment it with is we can augment it with the store to load distance which basically means that if there is a forwarding how many entries separate the store and the load right how so where it is measured because we have separate load and store queues so it can be the number of stores before it number of loads before it or a sum it doesn't matter uh, for a load it will typically be the number of stores before it so which will basically essentially be this distance where these are all stores so if this distance is d what we do is that a load waits till there are less than d entries before it in the ls queue so of course this needs to be interpreted contextually so in the context of this description it is the number of entries before it in the store queue so the load basically just waits till the number of entries in the store queue are till they are less than d which means until they are greater than or equal to d nothing but the moment it goes below d and no forwarding has happened you are kind of sure that no more forwarding will happen because this is what we have predicted so load at this point can be dispatched to the data cache right it can be sent to the data cache because what we predicted is that we predicted a collision but we predicted something more also what we predicted is that the store to load distance can be measured in different ways but let's measure it for the time being with the number of stores before the load so this was predicted as d and the moment that the distance between the load and the earliest store in the store queue right this falls below d we will find that this prediction pretty much doesn't hold which means that there is no more matching stores right there are no matching stores most likely of course so then the load can directly be sent to the data cache so this is an optimization no doubt it uses more information which is the distance d whenever we use more information we use more space so we expect a better prediction a more accurate prediction a more informative prediction in this case the prediction indeed gives us more information and this information can be used productively now let's come to another idea which is uh, one of the most uh, sophisticated ideas in this space so this is a far more refined proposal so to speak uh so as compared to the basic chd this mechanism is known as store sets so we start out in the same manner so always our predictors will keep on looking the same a uh, right pretty much our basic branch predictor design so here our explicit aim is to remember both store dependencies and pretty much for a load we should be able to say that which stores are kind of part of what is its store set but a store set is basically the set of all the stores that can forward their value to a load right pretty much like that store set is a set of stores so here is what we do so i will describe this kind of part by part because it's a kind of an intricate scheme but uh, once understood it will not appear to be that complicated so given a load or store we start in a conventional manner where we extract the n least significant bits we use it to access a 2 to the power n entry table 
So this table previously was giving us direct prediction information. In this case, it will not give us. It will instead give us a pointer to one more table. So what is the first table? The first table is the store set identifier table SSIT. Uh, what we read over here is for a load or store, we read its store set ID. So for every load in a simple design, we'll have one store set that is associated with it and that will have a unique ID. So we will discuss slightly later how that unique ID is given, but let's assume it has a unique ID. So then uh, the we will figure out this by reading this table. Similarly, the every store, it is part of one store set. So this, of course, in the initial proposal, it was one store set. Later on, it was extended to multiple store sets. But in this slide set, we are only discussing the simple idea, which is a single store set. So every store also, if you read, then uh, you will have a pointer to its store set ID, which is essentially the store set that comprises, uh, that doesn't compi comprise, but that contains this store. All right. So what we do is we use the store set ID, regardless of whether it's a load or store, we use it to access the LFST table, which is one more table. So if let's say this is a seven bit ID, then this table will have two raised to the power seven entries or 128 entries. Each entry stores the last fetched store in the store set. So as I said, a store set is basically a set of stores and it will tell us that look a certain store which is there in the pipeline is the latest in this store set which means it will most likely forward the value so how do we identify an instruction well we provide each instruction with a unique instruction number which pretty much if you read the book uh, it uh, pretty much is a number which is twice the size of the reorder buffer so it can be a circular counter, uh, which uh, can be, uh, I mean, any, anything more than actually the size of the reorder buffer, de depending upon uh, how we are willing to construct it. Uh, sorry, I stand corrected. So it's actually more than twice the size of the reorder buffer, such that if there is one instruction before it or after it, you will never have the same instruction repeating right so it's more than twice the size so so then if we have a cyclic counter like that we can generate a unique instruction number for every instruction in the pipeline such that at one point of time there should be no repetition so basically if let's say in the pipeline all instructions can have a unique number and furthermore if there is one instruction over here uh, so it will first start at the bottom of the ROB and gradually work its way up the ROB. So in its lifetime, it should never see two instructions with the same number that are actually different. So having an instruction number that is varies between let's say zero and any number that is greater than twice the ROB size, this to a certain extent solves this. So the long and short of this story is that every instruction is allotted a unique instruction number. And in the LFST table, we say that, look, in this store set, what is the instruction number of the latest store that has been fetched? So this, when, so this check, mind you, is done at decode time, not at resolution time. So the load basically knows that if I am the load, there are a lot of instructions that have been fetched before me. Out of these, some of these stores are in the store set. What is a store set? The set of all the stores that can potentially forward their value to the load. Out of this, this store is the latest. It's a part of my store set and it is the latest, which means this is the store that will mo most likely forward the value to me. The rest are important in the sense they are in my store set, but I don't care. I only care about the ID of the latest store because that is what is going to forward a value to me. And that to me, is the one that I should be concerned about. And this is the last fetch store in the store set. And how do I identify it? Well, as I said, we have a scheme of providing a unique instruction number to each instruction. And this is recorded in LFST given the store set. 
So load basically reaches the LFST via a single level indirect and it finds the latest store ID and it stores it. So every node load basically, if of course it has a store set associated with it, has the ID of the least fetched, sorry, latest fetched store LFST, which it will use. How will it use? Well, uh, so this is kind of a loaded text heavy slide, but let's uh, go slow. So what we have said is that for every load we have an associated store set. Stores that have forwarded values to it in the past are, are members of the store set. And a store in this case is a part of a single store set. But as I said, there are extensions to this idea where this rule is broken, but we are not considering that. So what do we do for loads and stores? Well, for loads and stores, of course, we do different things. So the first is that we read the store set ID, right? which is exactly what I'm showing over here. This is step one. The second is we get the instruction number of the latest store in the store set from the LFST. Of course, subject to the fact that it exists, which is step two. The load waits for store S to get resolved. So the load basically uh, locates the store S in the store queue or we can say that in the store queue whenever uh, the, a load is resolved it probes the store queue to find if a store with that instruction number is there so let's say this is the load which got resolved so once it does it finds the uh, actually this can be done before resolution also the moment we enter a load we if we know the LFST, the, the latest store of the, the store set uh, that this load is a part of, then the load can simply probe the store queue and find the entry in this, that is the latest fetch store, right? So then we can do several things. One is that if this has not been resolved, we wait for this to be resolved and we can check the addresses. The other is we don't have to check for the address. The moment we know what is to be stored, we can do a direct forwarding even before the address of the load has been computed. Right? So, so several things are possible. So, but in all cases, we can ignore all the instructions between the store and the load because with very high confidence, we have predicted that there is a dependency between the store and load. So let me explain this once again because this is a reasonably complex concept. So should be explained in different ways till you are able to understand it rather thoroughly. So the idea if I were to explain it in a different way would be that let us consider the conceptual view of the load store queue. So let us say that we add a load at this point at decode time. And at that point, we read the SSIT and LFST and we are sure that there is a store before it in the LSQ where uh, we clearly have a store set based match. So what can be done in this case is that if we really want to aggressively speculate when the value that will be stored, which is roughly also the time when it will get resolved, because let's look at a store. A store instruction will be, let's say, of this type, that store Rx, that's a sum offset, let's say it is 8, Ry. So what we will do is we will read Rx, we will read Ry, both from the register file roughly at the same time. And uh, then we will add 8 to Ry, that will give us the address of the store. And we will write both the values, which is the resolved address as well as the value that needs to be stored at the same time. Why at the same time? Well, because if we do it at different times, that will unnecessarily increase the number of ports that we require in LSQ. So in terms of impl implementation, it will be hard. So at the time of resolution, we will write both. See, the store has been resolved. Then, well, uh, we can directly take the forwarded data even before the load has been resolved and continue. So this will give us in a sense a certain speed up and we don't have to wait for the load to be resolved and 
this for as far as we are concerned is a performance enhancing optimization all right so this is uh, uh, clearly a very powerful thing because what we are doing is we are ignoring all the stores and lo loads well loads can be ignored but all the stores in between and even if they are unresolved we are saying that we don't care for a store what we do is we read the store set id and then uh, when are we accessing the store again let's say right after decode we are accessing the ssid so this store is clearly the latest instruction in the store set so we update the lfst with the instruction number of the current store and subsequently we can speculatively forward data to loads that are there in its store set well i wouldn't say loads are there in the store set but i would say that uh, loads that are supplied value by stores in its store set all right and uh, so this is how we can in a sense manage these fine grained dependencies and also increase the ilp using this technique when and where do we update the tables well the details are there in the book in chapter 5 but clearly when we detect a load store dependence then if a store set has already been allotted we simply add uh, the store set we simply add the load to the store set or we just record that for this given load this is the store set and let's say if the store is not a part of the store set then we add the store to the store set right we get rid of its previous mapping and we add it to the store set and let's see if the store set itself is not there then we create a new store set and we update the ssid ssid uh, such that both this store and this load point to the same store set so this bookkeeping is always done when we detect a dependence we need to do this bookkeeping with the ssid and lfst but that said and done this is clearly a very powerful optimization and it's clearly more effective than the chd because chd just predicts a collision in some cases it can predict the collision and also have distance information but again that's not that accurate because the distance can vary the code can vary right the behavior of the code can vary but this is a far more accurate method of predicting which stores will collide with which loads then we can explicitly wait for those stores and forward values and so on all right now let's come to the next which is load latency speculation so we do have a memory hierarchy much of this will be discussed in chapter 7 hence i really don't want to broach this topic right now but all that i can say is that look we have a hierarchy of memories for performance reasons of course so there is an instruction cache which i am not showing but uh, sorry uh, i am not showing this the instruction cache provides instructions to the pipeline uh, the data cache is fast we have assumed a 1 to 2 cycles it takes to access it has a very high hit rate of 90% for all the accesses that go below so this 50% is essentially a local hit rate in the sense that if 100 accesses come requests come to the l2 cache only 50% of those are satisfied this is a far slower structure it takes 10 to 50 cycles and of course if we don't find it in the l2 cache we go to the main memory where we will find everything again we'll break this assumption but let's assume it holds for the time being and this has a very long access time 300 to 400 cycles very long so we don't know for sure where we will find the data for a given load right so we don't know so that's the reason i buried my head in sand but you can always make a guess right so we love making guesses that is why we call this sub chapter aggressive speculation where we guess as much as we can in the hope of getting that last drop of ilp right it's like in you know, a searching for water in a desert we guess speculate as much as possible such that whatever we can extract in terms of a slightly higher instruction level parallelism we do that so for load instructions we predict if it will hit in the data cache or not if it will we do an early broadcast right and so let's say that uh, 
if let's say a small predictor says it'll hit in the data cache, well, no problem. Uh, we broadcast, we wake up the consumers. If the prediction is wrong, we need to do something. We'll see that in the next section. We can design a hit miss predictor for a load. Given the load PC, we can see whether it will hit or miss. The idea is very similar to a branch predictor. So we will not discuss the same thing over and over again. Here also we can use simple bits or we can use saturating counters. Right. So everything depends upon the nature of the workloads. So a lot of architectural simulation has to be done. But the basic pattern is the same. Right. So you know this by now. What else can we predict? Well, uh, it turns out we can predict values as well. So value prediction, as we have discussed, is the only way to break a read after write dependency between a producer and a consumer. The only way is if we can somehow predict the values that the consumer will use. And clearly one of the slowest instructions in this category, one of the biggest culprits in this category is a load instruction. All right. So the load instructions value is something that we can predict. All right. So why are values predictable? Well, many times we use there is data redundancy. So we use the same values over and over again. Like let's say it's a scientific program. We use the values of E and pi over and over again. Bit masking many a times, you know, even if uh, we are uh, considering long values, we're only interested in a few bits. So if those bits, in a sense, are predictable. Many times we're using constants in our code. Many times we have error checking code where uh, we almost never have errors, but a large part of the code is the same. A lot of values that it uses is the same. Virtual functions, well, virtual function is an important, virtual functions are important things in C++. So what they basically say Right. So, I, you know, my aim is clearly not to introduce an object oriented language here, but clearly uh, some introduction might, might be due that look, uh, let's say I have a vehicle class, right? So it de defines everything about a vehicle. And let's say in this you have get type. So vehicle will have a type. And then we have a subclass of vehicle, let's say cars. So cars will again have a definition for the get type function with the get type for a car will be a car, but for a vehicle, it might be undefined. So we can always have this. So this is the key of any object oriented program, right? We can always have a pointer to a car, like let's say in a car star. Uh, so as is the convention, uh, class starts with a proper uh, class starts with a capital letter and a variable with a small letter. So let's have a car. And let's say that we have initialized the properties of the car. So then we can have a pointer to a vehicle and set this equal to car, right? Now, what do we do is that let's say we send this pointer V across a set of functions, right? Doesn't matter. So let's say we send this uh, pointer far, far away. And then we call the get type function. So mind you, we are calling get type on a pointer to vehicle. But what will magically happen is that the car will also would have defined a get type function. What will magically happen is that instead of this function being called, actually this function of the car will be called because this vehicle is actually a car. Even though in the entire code we are using vehicle star, but this function will get called and this is a virtual function. And the way it actually does happen is that we have a small table with each object, which essentially says that look for get type. It just has a pointer to the PC. And in this case, it is this PC. So all of this code, right, for virtual functions is predictable. Similarly, register spilling, which we have already seen. So if we take a look at all of this, I would suggest the viewers to just take a look at this. These are all coding patterns, right? So for example, before object oriented code came along, virtual functions were not there. But once that came along 
and once let's say there was a big need for register spilling hardware always has to take into to account software patterns and virtual functions are clearly a big example of that that once programmers started writing programs in a certain manner hardware had to take that into account and then hardware had to be redesigned to in a sense ensure that uh, c++ programs run quickly right so that this the market for c++ programs which was not there in let's say the mid 80s by the late 90s had become huge in fact even now most of the proper software is written in c++ and other dotnet languages but c++ is still big very big so th this is where hardware designers had to step up and ensure that their processors could actually run these programs quickly and then they realized that virtual functions are a very important object oriented programming concept and this needs to be supported one of the key ways of supporting virtual functions is of course having support for function pointers right that is one in hardware which means that we need support for indirect branches where the target is not hardwired but it is stored in a register so this is undoubtedly required but other than that they also realize that many of the values that are used here are predictable so you need a value predictor so value predictors pretty much follow the same pattern that we have been discussing up till now which is either predict the last value or let's say the value increases with a constant stride predict it on the basis of a stride or you do it on the basis of profiling what is profiling well profiling is like this that we take the program we give it a set of representative inputs right so you give it a set of you know dummy inputs or representative inputs however you want to call it and you have a lot of instructions that are embedded in your profile program but they will not be a part of your final program which will essentially write the results of values and write uh, you know which direction the program is taking uh, write down the outcomes of branches a host of information to a file a regular file so this file can then be analyzed and then important pieces of this information can then be used to actually kind of pre program the hardware such that let's say for example you can say that look for this pc it most often takes this value uh, so so let's say if, if it's a load pc it most often reads this value from the memory system so all of this information will come via profiling and all of this information in a certain sense can be fed to the hardware via special instructions right if the hardware has a value predictor and instructions have been exposed to software to program it so in that sense you will see that your accuracy will improve substantially so i would advise all the viewers to take a look at the program sorry not uh, gprof what does gprof do i'll not tell you now but you take a look at it you'll get to know what it does so it is something on these lines along profiling but what it does you explore on your own ah uh, this is the last slide in this section where we discuss the use of confidence bits so as you have seen we have predicted a lot of things but of course our prediction should we predict all the time because many times unlike branches where we are forced to predict in many cases we need not predict so we can have a separate confidence table which will predict the confidence in the sense that how strong will the prediction be and this can use saturated counters so we can say that certain things can be predicted with high confidence if historically they have been very predictable otherwise we say that they are low confidence and then of course we'll have a predictor table as we have seen we enter the pc we get the prediction so we first use the confidence table to find out if it makes sense to predict simultaneously we also predict the predictor table can use you know a single value can use strides we can have complicated predictor tables that use the last k values and try to predict on the basis of that so these things can be arbitrarily complicated 
but the question is that whether we should use the predicted value or not we can use the separate confidence predictor to actually tell us all right and this is an important augmentation to our predictive prediction mechanisms because we don't want to unnecessarily predict low confidence stuff and just lose cycles right that would be really bad once the results are available we update both the confidence as well as the predictor table and of course if the results are available we also know whether we made a mistake or not so we recover with a replay flush mechanism next we will discuss replay mechanisms where we show how we recover from these misprediction misspeculated misspeculation related faults